The Tom Woods Show, episode 1331. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, you are unjustly depriving yourselves of a wonderful pleasure if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show but have not yet read my book, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. You can get the audiobook version with me narrating it for free through the Audible offer at TomWoodsAudio.com. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. The funny thing happened just this morning. I checked the private group we have for the people going on the Contra Cruise this year, and somebody posted that she was thinking of maybe not going this year, you know, maybe maybe she'd go in the future, but not this particular year, even though she's gone with us in the past. But she said there was a particularly good Tom Woods show episode. I think she's referring to the last one, number 1330. And she just said, oh, what the heck, we're going to go. So that's the spirit. So uh, remember, I, along with Bob Murphy, host a cruise. We're doing our fourth one this year in July 2019. We're going to Alaska. And if you think that isn't going to be an amazing time with awesome people, you don't know nothing about the Contra Cruise. It is an extraordinary event. We have a blast doing all kinds of fun things. You get to meet wonderful people, hang out with Bob Murphy and me. If you consider that to be a plus, then that's definitely one of the things that you will be doing. Gene Epstein will be moderating a debate between Bob and me on a serious issue. It has nothing to do with economics and has nothing to do with religion. But there is an issue, a serious one. This isn't a joke like, is a hot dog a sandwich? There's a serious issue that divides Bob and me. And since Gene does debate moderating, He's going to moderate a debate for us. We're just going to have an absolute blast. Brad Berzer is going to be there. I got to get him back on for a a bonus episode on music one of these days soon. But anyway, it's going to be a tremendous time. So make sure and sign up over at ContraCruise.com. We would absolutely love to have you. And you've been meaning to check out Alaska. It's on your bucket list. Why not do it with Bob and me? All right. I'm going to be uh, talking to you by myself again today. And I want to review something I saw posted on Twitter, a tweet couple of tweets. You may think, Woods, how low can you sink? You're going to talk about tweets on the air. But actually, some of my best work is in response to tweets, as a matter of fact, because there, because the post has to be short, you get so many conventional ideas in bumper sticker form just repeated to you as if they're brand new insights. Like, for example, when somebody brings up who would build the roads, They often raise it to you like no one's ever thought of this, and you've certainly never thought of it, you idiot, or you wouldn't be a libertarian. They take these totally conventional ideas and present them as if they're earth-shattering new innovations. And uh, that's got to be smacked down a bit. I see that quite a bit when people talk to me about the social contract because they don't actually make an argument for the social contract. I'll just say, well, listen, uh, there's a moral problem with taxation or with this or that other uh, thing that the state does, and then they'll come back with, oh, but you see, there's a social contract. Now, that's not actually an argument. That's just an assertion. And so the fact that they don't even argue for it goes to show that they think merely asserting it is enough for me to say, oh my gosh, can you believe I forgot about the social contract? There's no actual attempt to defend it. And then when I come back criticizing it, they usually just disappear. So anyway, I actually talked about this a bit in my newsletter the other day, but I'm, I'm going to expand on what I said in the newsletter because there's, uh, there's more to say. And in fact, there's been another tweet since that newsletter. I uh, guess you're probably tired of hearing me say, get on the newsletter list. Okay, this is like, this is my direct way of reaching you. I mean, yeah, I have the podcast, I suppose, but how do I know if you're going to listen on a given day? The best of you, of course, are listening every day. I, I got that. I know. But the email, that's the way we – that's the way you and I build a relationship. Okay? I send you emails and you enjoy them. All right? So I sent one the other day and it was – it had to do with somebody who was saying that libertarianism can't protect the vulnerable. So he writes, the wealthy would be further empowered over the rest without government. Many kids would be undereducated if the state didn't play a role. A lot of large infrastructure wouldn't get built, and foreign policy would be massively under-resourced. All right. Key one for me there is many kids would be undereducated because 
a lot of the problems with people who are going to criticize us come from not, I think, fairly assessing the current situation under a state-dominated system. Instead, they think ahead to some dystopian libertarian future. But what's actually going on in the current system? Many kids are undereducated right now with largely state provision of education. And one of the great merits of Brian Kaplan's book, The Case Against Education, which I interviewed him about some time ago, is he goes through, and this is not by any means his only argument, but he goes through and reviews the evidence of what people are actually getting out of their education. So he can go through surveys of adults, surveys in which adults are asked the most basic fundamental questions about science, history, and government. And they can't answer even half the questions. So as he says, look, these are not difficult questions. And, you know, well, you can't expect miracles. These are the most elementary questions you would need to understand the subject at all. And so Brian says, if, for example, you had somebody who knew barely half the letters of the alphabet, you wouldn't say that person was partially literate. You'd say that person was illiterate. So that's the reality of the situation. That's what the system has to show for itself. Now, imagine if the private sector dominated education and we had results like that. We wouldn't just pass them over in silence as is customarily done these days. This would be a national outrage and it would go to show that we have to put people before profits and you can't trust the private sector to provide education and we'd hear all this and that. But when the public sector yields us a result like this, well, it's hemming and hawing, it's excuse making. Uh, Generally, it's attempts to ignore studies like this. I mean, these would be front page headlines, front page everywhere if the situation were reversed and this were a private dominated system. But as of now, Almost no commentary on that at all, other than to say, and you already know what's coming, the schools are starved for funds. They need more money. Starved for funds? Are you kidding me? These schools have more funds than any schools in the history of the world. $12,500 per student per year is not enough. What are you spending it on? I I know everybody needs to have a computer and this and that. Okay, Well, you know what? I bet you with a chalkboard and some chalk, I could do a better job than they're doing. And then, of course, I never tire of mentioning the work of the great James Tooley, who's been on the show a couple of times. His work on low-cost private schools in the developing world is probably one of the most surprising things that I've learned in the whole five and a half years of doing this program. And I know a lot of you knew about it before, and good for you, and I'm glad you did. It goes to show that you're more plugged into some important things than I've been, that's for sure. But what he's shown, and then we also had uh, Pauline Dixon, who's worked with him and is also over at the University of Newcastle, to talk about the same thing. That completely under the radar for heaven knows how many years, low-cost private schools in the developing world have been educating more students than the government-run schools at lower cost than the government-run schools, and with better results than the government-run schools. And even parents in the developing world, where they, let's just say, don't have quite the incomes that we enjoy in, for instance, the United States, are still scrounging up the money to send their kids to these schools. That's an amazing story. That's an amazing story. So the idea that many kids would be undereducated, that's exactly the opposite of the truth. It's the private sector that's doing the educating in in place after place. So maybe if I have a good memory, you know what? How about instead of relying on a memory, I'll write it down, write it down. I'm going to put those Thule and Dixon episodes up. Uh, But you know what you should also do? I have a free ebook on this and this, uh, not just this, but education in general. And this will also get you on my mailing list because yes, I know you get a lot of email, but you're going to enjoy my emails. You're going to look forward to them. You're going to see Tom Woods in the send column, and you're going to say, all right, whether or not it's a clever subject line, I'm opening this thing, all right? You do have to occasionally check your spam folder. I've told you about this before. Got to check that spam folder. That spam folder can be evil. It's trying to keep you from things that you specifically said you wanted. That's a very bad thing, so make sure and check that. Anyway, um, I have an ebook called Education Without the State. That's a good one. That's a good one. So you can pick that up at nostateeducation.com. 
And that'll really help you when you're in discussions like these. Then, I think this might have been my favorite part of the tweet. Foreign policy, let's say if there were no state or or less of a state, foreign policy would be massively under-resourced. Well, in the case of the U.S. government and the neocons, I'm I'm waiting to hear what the problem with that is. (laughs) That's a uh, feature, not a bug, right? I would want it to be under-resourced. You know, I think I think the world would be a lot better off and more stable and less crazy and less radical Islam everywhere if the U.S. government's foreign policy had been massively under-resourced. As it was, it was massively resourced. And where'd those resources go? Down one sinkhole after another, taking countless lives with them. I just cannot fathom somebody looking at that record and being worried that not enough neoconservative foreign policy would be able to occur and that this would be a terrible tragedy. Now, infrastructure, that's a separate matter, and eventually I'll do an episode on that. I mean, I did do an episode uh, pretty darn close to that with the An Architecture podcast people. So I'm going to link to that also at uh, tomwoods.com slash 1331. That's where I'll, I'll put this stuff because we did talk about how you'd have private provision of a lot of the what we might call the built environment from roads along to other things. So uh, we'll do that separately. Of course, you know, Walter Block has a whole book on the privatization of roads and highways. So there's that. Uh, there's also the fact that there's no really non-arbitrary way to know which infrastructure projects are necessary and which are just boondoggles to satisfy political constituencies. There's a bridge over here that seven rich people need, but nobody else needs. So where are they going to build it? That that kind of thing goes on all the time. I remember when I was out on Long Island, there were three campuses of Suffolk Community College. There was one in Brentwood, one in Selden, which was the main one. And then there was one uh, in Riverhead, the so-called Eastern Campus. The Eastern Campus had very few students and it was it was a white elephant. There was really no reason for it to be there. But I had heard through the grapevine that it was put there because certain local politicians thought it would be nice to have um, an institution of learning nearby. So, so there it was, you know. Now, okay, I get that a community college is not infrastructure, but you see the idea that that kind of motivation tends to be behind it. So when there's no market feedback, how do you know what you need and how much of it you need and where you need it and with what tools and whatever? And you may say, well, Woods, there's no way to have a market feedback in cases like this. Well, check out that uh, 805 tomwoods.com. I think it's 805. I'll just double check. Wouldn't it be scary if I actually knew that by heart? If it is 805, I'm going to be scared. Let's let's check. Oh, it's not. Thank heavens. <laughs> okay, good. I don't actually know um, all the episodes by heart. It's 802. All right. <laughs> okay. Whew, that was close. I don't, I don't want to be like one of those Star Trek convention people you know, where they know more about Star Trek than the actual actors. I mean, I guess in my case, I would be the equivalent of the actual actor. Still, I don't want to know my own show quite that well. All right. So anyway, the, I, I would refer you there and and we'll at some point try and, and revisit this. I have definitely done episodes on roads and a lot of the stuff that you say about roads can just be applied to um, other aspects of, of uh, infrastructure. So let's see, what was the rest? What's the other stuff? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he also, in, an, in another tweet, says affirmative action is something the downtrodden can't live without. Now, there, you know, you do have to get into a moral argument at some level about the extent to which it is morally acceptable to punish living people who did nothing wrong, to benefit living people who did not suffer from the original wrong. And we can certainly have that argument. But if I just want to stick to some hard and fast numbers to make you, you know, rethink the idea that the state is always everybody's savior. I hear call into service Thomas Sowell. And now, unfortunately, his book, Civil Rights, Rhetoric, or Reality, is published over 30 years ago at this point. 30, I think it's 34 to 35 years ago. So some of the statistics are not up to date. But the statistics for the time periods he talks about are obviously still accurate. And I think that's one of his best books, and I hear almost nobody talking about it, but it's a tremendous book. And in fact, I think you can still find my review of it on Amazon back from the year 2001. I've loved this book for years. I used to assign it in class back when I was a professor. So anyway, Sowell says this. He says that, and and by the way, this is a point I've made on this show before, 
that there will be some existing favorable trend and the state will take credit for it. So let's say it's workplace safety. Then we get OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health, um, I guess, administration. And then we see that, you know, fatalities and injuries on the on the job start to decline. And we get told, well, this is obviously because of the regulatory body. But what we don't get told is this trend was already in existence and was actually moving down 70% faster than before we got OSHA. But nobody knows that. So if most people simply internalize the state's version of the story, whereby everything was terrible, we got a regulatory body, everything's better. Well, likewise, so Sowell says, we can say the same kind of thing about minority employment uh, because we see there were uh, extraordinary trends well underway long before even the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So Sowell writes this, in the period from 1954 to 1964, for example, the number of blacks in professional, technical, and similar high-level positions more than doubled. In other kinds of occupations, the advance of blacks was even greater during the 1940s when there was little or no civil rights policy than during the 1950s when the civil rights revolution was in its heyday. Then he continues, The rise in the number of blacks in professional and technical occupations in the two years from 1964 to 1966 after the Civil Rights Act was in fact less than in the one year from 1961 to 1962 before the Civil Rights Act. If one takes into account the growing black population by looking at percentages instead of absolute numbers, it becomes even clearer that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 represented no acceleration in trends that had been going on for many years. The percentage of employed blacks who were managers and administrators was the same in 1967 as in 1964 and 1960. Nor did the institution of, quote, goals and timetables, unquote, at the end of 1971, mark any acceleration in the long trend of rising black representation in these occupations. True, there was an appreciable increase in the percentage of blacks in professional and technical fields from 1971 to 1972, but almost entirely offset by a reduction in the percentage of blacks who were managers and administrators. Unquote. That's that's the passage from Seoul. Seoul uh, further notes that Asians and Hispanics in the United States show similar long-term upward trends that had begun years before the passage of the 1964 Act and which were not accelerated either by the Act itself or by the affirmative action programs that inevitably followed. So Mexican-Americans' incomes rose in relation to those of whites between 1959 and 1969, but not at a greater rate than between 1949 and 1959. Chinese and Japanese American households had matched their white counterparts in income by 1959 and were earning one-third more by 1969. All right, let me take just a minute to tell you about a fun service I've been playing around with this week. It's called Curiosity Stream. It's a subscription streaming service, and it offers over 2,000 documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. It was founded by John Hendricks, who, as you may know, is the founder of the Discovery Channel. When I logged into it, first thing I did was I watched Destination Mars because I've been really interested in this idea of settling Mars. I think it's a crazy idea, but yet I can't look away. I'm fascinated. But the content goes way beyond that. Science, nature, history, technology, society, and lifestyle. And when you click on any one of those categories, you get taken to a variety of subcategories. There is so much here to explore. Well, go to curiositystream.com slash woods for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And for my listeners, enter promo code woods when prompted during the signup process, and your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. That's curiositystream.com slash woods and use promo code woods to get 30 days free. All right, now finally, there's another tweet where the person is saying that, um, If you're going to rely on benevolent, wealthy people to help people out of poverty, well, why aren't they doing that already? Millions remain in poverty. And he says that history shows us that the powerful are not sufficiently concerned for the welfare of the poor, which is why the welfare state was created. Now, I'll probably somewhere down the road do an episode on why the welfare state was created. Rothbard has some interesting material on this because the usual explanations that there was a lot of poverty or 
there was industrialization, uh, there was uprooting from communities, you know, whatever it is, really don't hold water um, for a lot of reasons. You think they would, but they actually don't. So something else must be going on. There certainly was not a general uprising among the people. So, I mean, of course, he's got this fantasy version that the people righteously demanded what was rightfully theirs and the responsive politicians gave it to them. That has no connection to reality whatsoever. So uh, maybe I'll link to, why don't I link to Rothbard on this? Uh, Rothbard on welfare state. If you'd like to get a head start and take a look at that, that'll be at tomwoods.com slash 1331. But let me share a few thoughts about this. Uh, we've done some episodes on it. Certainly we did a great episode with David Beto on mutual aid and the welfare state. And he's written a tremendous book about that, about fraternal organizations before the welfare state and how they basically played the role of the welfare state, except much better because you know people are less likely to game the system when it's their own friends whose contributions are helping them. And of course, the fraternal organization doesn't go around bragging how many people are sitting idle on the dole, basically. I mean, not that they really had a dole. They would help you with funeral expenses and stuff like that. But generally, the government will brag about how many people it's serving instead of how many people escaped from it. The, the incentive structure is all wrong uh, with the welfare state. And it, it does absolutely deform people's decision-making. If you've ever seen anybody trapped in it, I mean, I've seen a head of household, for example, who desperately needed a job, but turned up his nose at a job at um, Panera Bread. It's not not the most, um, you know, let's let's say prestigious job in the world, but it would have put food on the table. But no, he's going to just keep on waiting till the ideal one comes along. And it was just a very frustrating to see the the distortions that go on. It's not it's not helping. So uh, I've talked a little bit about what Charles Murray says in his book, Losing Ground, American Social Policy, 1950 to 1980. What he argues, he makes a theoretical argument that poverty persists in the U.S. not in spite of anti-poverty programs, but because of them. I mean, why should the number of people living in poverty stop declining just as public assistance program budgets and the rate of increase in those budgets were the highest? And he says, well, here's why. He says, try to devise a social program that will not cause net harm. And you may have heard me give the example of imagine a government program aimed at discouraging smoking. Now, he's got a lengthy argument here, but the point is this. The reward that the government offers for people who quit smoking has to be substantial enough to persuade them to go to the trouble of quitting, but not so substantial as to encourage non-smokers to start smoking in pursuit of the reward. And it turns out this task turns out to be next to impossible. So to start with, we have to identify a target group that the program will apply to and then an appropriate monetary reward for quitting smoking. So obviously, if you've been smoking for three days, you can't be eligible for the reward. Or if you smoke only one cigarette a day, we got to draw some arbitrary line to determine eligibility. So maybe we could say the program will apply to people who have been smoking at least a pack of cigarettes a day for five years. And then writing back in 1984, uh, Murray proposed a reward of $10,000. I don't know how much that would be in today's dollars. So here, here come the problems. Anybody who's been smoking for four years and 11 months obviously has an incentive to keep smoking for at least another month to get the 10 grand. A correspondingly weaker but nevertheless significant incentive exists for somebody who's been smoking for four years, four years even, to continue for another year, and so on. Likewise, for those who smoke less than a pack a day, someone who smokes, say, 18 cigarettes a day, has an incentive now to smoke two extra cigarettes per day in order to qualify for the reward. And then you have people on the fence about whether they should begin smoking. So teenagers in particular, the reward may actually be the deciding factor for the marginal smoker. And anybody who's been smoking for fewer than five years or not at all, or less than a pack a day has incentive to begin smoking, to continue, or even increase his smoking. That's the bottom line. And then moreover, you may think a $10,000 reward is adequate inducement to quit, but once you become addicted, you may find that reward is not so powerful after all. And so given you know, the human inclination to acquire wealth with the least possible exertion, it's quite possible to imagine that welfare itself would also have an addictive aspect to it. And here we see the fallacy in the, the common refrain, it would cost only X billion dollars to give every American who needs it such and such benefit. 
once people figure out that the government is giving out a benefit for free, more and more people are going to place themselves in the condition that entitles them to the benefit, thereby making the program ever more expensive, society poorer, and the system more fragile because you'll have a narrower and narrower base of productive individuals forced to support an ever-growing population demanding benefits. Uh, the 1960s, the philosophy of welfare rights was encouraged, which of course uh, made the problem worse. Now, you know, for all this, you nevertheless hear the response that private charity is surely inadequate. And so they'll say, look at these terrible conditions people lived in 100 years ago, and then they congratulate themselves for relieving that. But that's just a common error. The, the problem there is the whole society was much poorer. So, and then of course, if you look at the substandard housing that you find in that Jacob Rees book, How the Other Half Lives from 1891. Of course, that was deplorable. What you had was a huge, huge number of immigrants uh, and also just people moving to the cities for jobs, all of a sudden putting intense pressure on the existing housing stock. So Lillian Wald, who was a settlement house pioneer, noted that by 1930, she found that these houses that were featured in that book where overcrowding had been deplored were practically empty. Because the families who had lived there had, by that point, moved to more comfortable accommodations in Brooklyn and the Bronx. So anyway, there's so much that can be said about this. But also, again, the, the incentive structure here, the incentive structure for the poor themselves and but also for the welfare bureaucracy, which has interests of its own. If we look at, let's say, what would it be? About a quarter century. Let, let's start from like 1967 you know, just as the uh, war on poverty, great society programs are starting to heat up, over the next quarter century, they quadrupled the amount of money spent per poor person. And yet poverty had more, more or less stagnated. And it turns out that poor people who don't receive government welfare are two and a half times more likely to escape poverty within a year than those who do receive it. How about that? But again, look at the welfare bureaucracy. This is a passage from a book called Overcoming Welfare by James Payne. He writes, welfare today is an enormous industry, much larger than the defense establishment or the tobacco industry or chemical companies. It supports over 700,000 social workers, 420 schools of social work, thousands of special interest groups, nonprofit organizations, and commercial firms, and some 43 million beneficiaries. Day in and day out, welfare leaders work to expand their industry. And then he cites a candid description of the system by a social security official in a Midwest field office. And that official said this, in the field, I was a supervisor out there for years and years. Your staffing, your budget for supplies, and your awards money for the employees was based on work units. Now, work units were assigned based on the number of claims you took. So we would sit around and figure out how we could get more people on the SSI rolls because it would benefit us. The more applications we took, the more work units, the bigger the staff, we could build up an empire. Wow. Then we find out that it takes, for a variety of reasons, $5 going into the government to get $1 to the poor. I talk about that in my book, Rollback. So we've got all that inefficiency. You don't need to reproduce the entire government uh, welfare budget. Then also Charles Murray in his book, In Pursuit of Happiness and Good Government, shows some very suggestive evidence in a very interesting graph that there's a correlation between when people feel like the government is taking over the provision for the poor and then people's own contributions start to drop. But then when they hear, wait, the government is cutting back, even though they really weren't in the 1980s, they really weren't cutting back. People thought they were. Charitable donations went back up again. And Murray gives the thought experiment of, suppose the whole welfare state disappeared tomorrow. How would you react? You're telling me you wouldn't do anything? You wouldn't volunteer at a local literacy program? You wouldn't offer pro bono services to the poor in whatever industry you're in? You wouldn't do anything? What kind of a person are you? You really wouldn't do anything? Of course, And the answer is, of course you would. So why are you not doing it now? And that proves that the welfare state crowds out private contributions and private hands-on volunteering. It proves it because everybody listening to this knows I'm right. We would all be doing more if we didn't feel like, oh, somebody else, you know, I sent them a check and whatever. So uh, that's, that's where I'll leave it, except to also note that 
the poverty he's talking about that millions are in, I, I don't want to make light of it because I certainly wouldn't want to be in poverty and I wouldn't want to make, you know, 24K a year or whatever. But at the same time, $32,400 a year puts you in the global 1%. So we have to put this in perspective. I mean, if being in the global 1% and probably the historical 0.1%, if probably even, even more elite than that, we have to put this in perspective. We haven't had great wealth for all that long in human history. So hold your horses here. I mean, it's it's a miracle what we have so far. So we ought to focus on that. And then also what has actually lifted them out of poverty, it's capital investment that makes our labor more productive, produces more stuff, and makes that stuff more affordable in terms of the wages we earn. That's what's done it. And when you just siphon off huge amounts of money to go into some government bureaucracy, you are taking money that some of which would have gone into capital investment and you're starving the economy for that. So you're slowing down the process of the increase in the standard of living. So I'm going to leave it there. I got some neat resources at tomwoods.com slash 1331. And let's see, tomorrow I got Brian McClanahan coming back and we're going to do another uh, taking a part of an article. It's going to be really juicy and fun. So um, definitely tune in for that. Also, um, you know, those of you, I got some wantrepreneurs on my uh, email list. And if you've been thinking, you know, look, uh, January is just about over and I swore to myself I would get busy on my new business or my new income stream or whatever. Well, I've written an ebook. How about that? I've written an ebook on everything, but I've written an ebook on this. Very detailed. It's very step-by-step. -step, doesn't cost you anything on different approaches you might take. So I, I talk about my experience with self-publishing as an income stream, but not just that. Also things that I think more people would be interested in. I just go through exactly what I did, um, how I did it, what programs I used, what links you should follow, stuff like that. So you can get that for free at pathstoincome.com. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.